to see it through But you have proven you got better things to do Still I'd hoped you'd find your way Guest, Allison Wedding. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is my lovely guest, Allison Wedding. Allison and I met a number of years ago, uh, um, kind of, I guess, th somewhat through Rhiannon. But you, you and Emil had gone to one of Rhiannon's um, All In, right? Right, all the way in. Yeah, and then I remember you. I remember the place where you came and you sat in. Uh, it was a little place in Altadena, and uh, that that 
uh, an organization that I had was performing. And um, I remember seeing you sing and, <laughs> and, uh, and thereafter, I mean, you know, you're nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's why we like each other. <laughs> wow. We, I mean, that was a long time ago now that yeah. we met. Wow. That was because, yeah, I met you shortly after I arrived in LA. Oh, okay. So I think that was before, uh, that was in 1990. It had to have been like 97, 98 around there. Yeah. You know, for the longest time, that that didn't sound like it. Not lo it didn't sound long ago. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm beginning to okay. Like yeah, before 2000, it was actually a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, I I've always thought the sound of your voice was really unique and real beautiful, and um, uh, uh, people are on already, and they're they're commenting on that. Um, and um, yeah, so yeah, just really beautiful. I remember, I'll talk about this later too, but I remember hearing the record that you made in um, Australia, Australia. Uh -huh. and uh, when I heard um, the Beatles song, um, She Gives Me All, what is the title? Is, oh, And I Love, well, it's And I Love Her, but I really? did And I Love Him. Yeah. That song killed me, and the fact that you—well, I won't blow the—I won't blow the surprise because I'm going to play that. But the fact of, of the space that you left—I mean, that was to me that was like, Mwah! you know. Oh, <laughs> thank really you beautiful. so much. That that project was such a a gift and a surprise. Um. It, it came from actually a radio show. Um, ABC Jazz had like a kind of a radio show and we went in, the, the band that I worked with um, on that album, that was Belinda Moody on bass, who is now located in New Orleans. She's incredible. Oh, wow. Colin Hopkins on piano, Danny Fisher on drums, and me. <laughs> piano, bass, drums, am I missing anything? Um, and it just was a really, uh, we had uh, compositions from each one of us and we did a couple of those covers, but it was just super kind of in the moment and very raw. And the engineer was Mal Stanley, awesome engineer. And it was, I don't know, it just ended up being this whirlwind of a thing where we, you know, they did it for the radio show and then the label came and said, we want to release it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then the next thing I knew I had a tour, you know, a manager helped us tour around and it just, it was such a beautiful experience. But that album, went, you know, I had a hard time listening to that album. Um, I don't know if you go through that, but it's, I, I have a hard time listening to myself after the fact. But now I can listen to that and go, that was a really nice snapshot of that time. And it yeah. was, it was, it symbolized something and I, I really am very happy and the, my band was incredible so yeah yeah it, the recording process is a little it's it's interesting because you live with something for so long first of all that you just are sick of it kind of right after right and it needs it needs a little bit of space for you to look back and go oh yeah that was that was actually nice yeah and um you know letting go of your opinions of yourself you know of sing the singing that you did on it I mean, it's just such a snapshot of the moment. And, you know, I mean, kind of, that is what it is, you know. I mean, you can fix it in the studio, but it's still going to be what it is in the moment. And and sometimes it's hard It's hard to accept that. Right. Yeah. Definitely. I, I'm such, uh, I'm very hard on myself in that process, yeah. you know, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, generally, I don't know about you, but generally I produce my singing uh, because I don't fully trust anyone in the studio. You know, even my friends, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I know I'm very sensitive and uh, I don't want somebody to say the wrong thing that'll crumble me and make me not able to sing. So I'd rather, 
I know what sounds good, right. I think, you know, so I'd rather just, you know, kick my own self in the butt, you know. <laughs> right. I, I totally get it. I mean, I tell my students this too, the, the voice is such an, an, a unique instrument in the fact that it's a part of us. Yeah. So if you have the wrong producer who says something, it's like, well, you yeah. know, can, we really, can I fix that? I don't know, you know, and it, it's hard to not take it personally. Yeah. Also, the thing that, and you're probably the same, the thing that I like to hear when I'm producing or teaching too, is I want to hear authenticness. That's what I want. I don't really care if the voice, I, in fact, I don't really love singers who sing perfectly. I don't really love that. It doesn't, I, I would rather not hear that kind of singing. Right. Um, so, um, so that's what I would want somebody, I would want to feel that somebody else really was aware of that and, and was speaking to that. And, and that's what I listen for in myself too, you know. Yeah. authenticness you know i'm always going to sing flat a little here and there i'm gonna i'm gonna do it i'm always amazed when i'm in tune a lot you know? <laughs> <laughs> like wow i actually was in tune through that whole thing that's good but um but yeah it's um it, i mean and also of course the more technique you know the more you're listening for the technique i don't know it's just such a <laughs> it's a layered it's it's really layered when you're doing everything when you're a teacher when you're a singer or when you're a musician you know it's layered you know and right. and uh, we can't help kind of look at it with all those eyes right i yeah i i think of what i feel when i'm listening myself to well it's been a long time since i've been at an actual gig of someone else's in person yeah i, miss, I really miss that yeah but I think about the things that I listen for. And, you know, some people ask me, are you always thinking technique? And I mean, it's hard to not think that, Yeah. you know, when you've been teaching for, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say how long it's been, like 27 years or something. <laughs> but, um, but that's not really what I'm listening for in the end. I just, and I tell my students, I just want to be moved. And that sometimes it is that raw thing. Sometimes it is a pitch bend or a crack in the voice or somebody breaking down in the middle of a song that gets me to the point. I mean, I can almost get to tears just thinking about that stuff. I love to see the human side of people when they're performing. Yeah. It's such a beautiful thing to me. And yeah, the, every note being perfect and nailing every change is just not what it's about. Yeah. It's about, telling a story and taking me on a journey and grabbing me, grabbing my heart and, you know, pulling me in. And that's, that's what I strive to do. And that's what I, I love to hear myself. Yeah. And an <laughs> addendum to that, when you do hear somebody who does everything, then I know where you and I are totally blown away. A singer who does that for me is uh, Sina E. Do you know her singing? Sina E. I don't think I do. She's from, uh, uh, is it Denmark? Denmark, I think. Anyway, you guys listening, you probably. Ooh, I she, love it. I'll have to check her out. Yeah, Sina, S-I-N-N-E, and then E-E-G. And okay. um, I've seen her for years. I mean, she's not that old. She's stunningly beautiful outside and inside. She's really a lovely person. And over the years, like at first, she was a, actually a sax player and didn't start singing for a long time. And then, so you could see her progress in her singing. The last time I saw her was, I guess, it was, uh, it was uh, after January. It was after that the New York, um, you know, Jazz Congress. It was mm -hmm. back here because there were there was a week with her and uh, Luciana Souza and. Uh, Michelle Nicole from Australia. Yeah, I know Michelle well. Oh, well, the three of them were in one week. And it was just it was a great week for a singer to <laughs> hear great singing. And um, but that so when I saw Cinna, I was, it was with Larry Koontz and Josh Nelson. And I I was totally blown away because she had everything going. You know, yeah. her technique is great. And she really knows the music and she 
really is has an emotional point of view about it and she has all these subtleties and she's playing with the musicians so you know when you hear something like that it's it's pretty rewarding you know yeah. oh wow i can't wait to check her out That's yeah awesome. yeah. <laughs> yeah but um yeah so we're we have we're fans of the same i'm sure the same people <laughs> Um, let's see what Mark, Kathy and Allison, do you produce your own music and have a co-producer to work with you just to get feedback? You first. Um, yes. Well, it depends on the project that I, I mean, my, my most recent album, it's a very interesting, that was an experiment. Um, the album before, uh, was on the ground up label, which is the, uh, ground up. Yeah, that's the Snarky Puppy label. Oh, and Michael, okay. Michael League was in my band, and I was. Oh, um, he was the main producer. Of course, I I'm always in the room, you know, making help, you know, making decisions alongside. But he was the main producer. But this last album, I did a complete departure from the album of four in that it was very raw. It was a duo project with an awesome guitar player named Matt Gold from Chicago and they're all my original tunes. The, the album before it was all my original too, but I wanted to do something just really raw and in the moment. Yeah. Not, not a lot of bells and whistles. I didn't want, you know, a lot of, you know, I, it, it was just mostly duo. We added a little bit of percussion after Matt's also a great percussionist and he layered a couple of guitar things but other than that it was just the two of us in a room in someone's house huh. and we you know produced that stuff together and it was it was very it was a very cool experience and very scary at the same time because i thought you know people are going to hear this and it's not as polished as my previous album yes and they might not like that but i was excited about it because it was like this is just me in that moment and and it was just that you know so polished in which way oh just a lot of effects i didn't have a ton of like the, my other album had strings mm. lots of stacked background vocals i yeah. had special guests on there chris potter played on a tune Lionel loeke played on a tune theo blackman came and sang a, a duo with me and um, or a duet with me and he had his looping in and in the front and the back of it. I mean, it was just very kind of a lush album compared to this, which was just guitar and voice with a couple of little see, layers, yeah. but so, and I didn't, I let some things go, uh -huh. uh, sound like what we were talking about pitch wise, sound wise. I just, I, I wanted the emotion of that moment to be captured and I wasn't going to sacrifice that for anything. And I didn't want to go back and use Melodyne and clean up. Right. Stuff. Right. Yeah. So that was kind of a roundabout answer to that question. So <laughs> I, I do like to, I definitely love to be in the room and, and producing for yeah. sure. And yeah. you? Me too. And um, I don't think there's, been any recording that I haven't produced my voice on uh, and I I have like 13 um, but th actually the 13th was with Ted Green that was more of a just a documentary of of what we did and part of it actually all of it was live so and yeah it and it was fine and it was really highlighting Ted Green because he's such a um, renowned guitar player but um but what I was going to say was, uh, um, I think a good producer uh, realizes that it takes a tribe, you know, a village, as they say. And right. um, so just like being a good singer, you when the piano player is playing, you're not telling the piano player how to play. You're, you might suggest a groove, right, or... Or in this spot, you know, empty or things like that. But that's a different kind of producing rather than forcing people to do what you want. Um, 
So I think a good producer takes into consideration that they're gathering the people that they know and feel are going to create something beautiful and and then uh, in certain moments steps back and allows things to happen in their natural way that they're going to happen. Um, right. And... Um, you know, we've already talked about how what we listen for in ourselves, you know, um, authentic, authenticness and ha having fun. And of course, good quality. We're, we want to be a good quality singer, but right. that's, that's not necessarily, well, it's definitely not the only thing we listen for, obviously. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but um, producing, especially producing other people, like when I'm paid to produce other people, um, over the last few years, I've definitely, um, it's a growth. It's a suit. It's a real growth to allow myself to be right about m what I hear and to mm -hmm. feel comfortable telling people what to do. You know, right. that, that actually was, a very wonderful experience to, you know, get to the place like there was even a, an engineer that I actually had a conversation with because the engineer because I'm I'm a more quiet individual, you know, my observations are quiet and right. then I act. And this other uh, engineer is not like that, just very forward and talking and wonderful, you know, very arranger like. And, um, but I had to actually talk with them and say, you know, just because I'm like this, don't ignore me, you know, let's right. work together, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it worked. It actually blossomed into a great relationship, you know, would you say that in that role that you took on, I mean, don't you think it requires, and you seem like you have this so much intuition and empathy, right? With the artist to really, yeah. I would, I feel like. If you're going to be producing someone else's music, you really have to get in almost inside their heart and in their mind to do that. Yeah, which is a special gift. Yeah, yeah, it is because it's and it's like uh, kind of goes back to how are your relationships with people? Right. You know, can you do that in a conversation? You know, right. and. Um, because that's really what it is. You have to, like you, like you just said, you have to have empathy for them. You have to really understand. And being a good teacher, of course, is like that too. You have to get into their head. It's ridiculous for you to, you know, beat them over the head with a stick. Do it this way. Do it this way. That's stupid because that's right. it's not going to happen well, you know. So you have to get into their perspective and see what it is they're having trouble with or they're doing well with. Right. And kind right. of leap from there, too. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's an interesting life. <laughs> <laughs> we are we're really learning, you know, while we're here and and uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that's what it's all about. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Well, um, so uh, let's see. There's a few people. Um, I I think that there are people that you don't totally know. But is this a person you know, Tony Sattel? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So they're here. Uh, Tanya Grubbs. Do you know her? Tanya. Wow. Hi, <laughs> Tanya. <laughs> She's a love, and uh, I don't think you know Sandy Cummings. She's a singer from Santa Barbara. Tony uh, says that uh, he's been hearing that you might release some singles or a single here and there. Is that something you're considering as a new approach to releasing your music? I I do think about that a lot. And I, I've learned from my students in that way. It's really interesting watching um, current students and former students and, and what they're doing and how they're blowing up on social media. And, uh, I think that is a really great way to get music out there. And I, I have been thinking about it there. I'm working on a few different things right now. I started recording a solo 
piano and voice album where I'm, I'm playing and singing. Uh, that is scary for me. That is very scary for me. Um, I love playing piano. I'm definitely a singer who plays piano. I am not a pianist who sings, but, um, that's good. I think it's going to be a bit of a process. I like, I, I laid down about four tunes before the winter break and I got the, some of the stuff back. And of course the piano was okay. Funny, funnily <laughs> enough, the piano was okay, but I didn't like the way I sang it. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to redo this. <laughs> um, but yes, I would like to do more single type stuff. And I'm also working on some children's music. And it's funny, Tony Sattel is my writing partner on this. So that's, thank you, Tony, for asking this question. Um, that's a new discovery that I made in the pandemic. Tony and I started, uh, writing, um, there was a book that came out called Anna and the germ that came to visit. And we decided to write a little, a germ song for kids to go with that book. And it was so much fun. And I really got to learn how to use, first I was using GarageBand and then I graduated to Logic. Um, and then we just started writing a bunch of children's music and it's super exciting. We haven't really, the only song we've released officially is the germ song, but we've got <laughs> uh, some other stuff going on and we've got a little book oh. going out too with one of the songs uh, that's being illustrated by an awesome illustrator. And cool. So that's like a whole new chapter of my music life that I never ever thought I would do. And now it's so much fun because our, basically our goal is to try to create music that's sophisticated ish, but still like children will listen to it and, and get along with it, but not just baby shark. N no offense to baby shark, but you know what I mean? A little yeah. more sophisticated than yeah. that. But it's tricky because, you know, you have to kind of sit back and go, wait, that's a little, that's a little yeah. too complicated. That those changes, mm, those don't, you know, or or, I think that's a little more complex than a child would like to hear, you know. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Is that is the germ song out on social media mm -hmm. that we could actually watch? It's it? it is. It's called Hey Germ, Go Away. Okay, and let me you can find it. You can find it. On, it's really short. You can find it on YouTube. <laughs> okay. Hey germ. What is it? Go. Hey germ, comma, go away. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm excited. Okay. Right here. Is this yep. it? Yep. Wow. And then it's got a little bit of a... I need to send that to my grandchildren. <laughs> oh yeah. Wow, it's that's... just been, it's been so fun and such a, it, yeah. And we, Tony and I have a, a really kind of, I had not done a, to a ton of co-writing in my life. And Tony uh. and I have this really just, things come really quickly and he comes up with these really great like changes and then a, a starting melody. And then we, I don't know, it just all happens. So. It's been really great. We we just uh, there's a the book is um, about the zoo and it's it's been really fun going to the zoo. So, 
That's cool. Yeah. I Go ahead. Co-writing is, is great, but it's also, <laughs> I find it intimidating sometimes. Like there's this one girl who keeps saying, oh, we need to, <coughs> excuse me. Bless you. <laughs> we need to Go write ahead. together. And, then, and I'm like, I feel like really stupid. I'm bad. And she knows why I'm doing it, but I feel like I'm backing out because she's such a good writer. She writes like Bonnie Raitt. And I'm like, I write like a jazz, you know, Gemini or something. <laughs> you know, that's, that's that what I think of my writing. But that combination could be super magical. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Maybe. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of the other co-writing things I've done. I, I co-wrote a song. Oh, my gosh. Back when I lived in L.A., I, I know I co-wrote a song with Cindy Berkwin, who's a beautiful uh -huh. singer. Um, is but she we never still really here, did. by the way? She is in, I think she's there now. I'm, I'm having a, a, she's moved a few times and now I'm having a, a mind, a mind uh, fart. Um, but That's I think, okay. I think she's there. I think she's there now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I, I actually co-wrote a song with my mom, who I think might be watching right now. Um, Hi, mom. We wrote a couple of things together, actually. Um, but other than that, I, I and I hope I'm not forgetting anything. But yeah, so this is kind of a new thing for me, but it is really, it's super exciting. And I, I felt very intimidated, too, to do it. Because I'm thinking, what if my style doesn't gel or, you know, I definitely have the jazz sensibility more than the pop sensibility. So, yeah. Um, but I think that hybrid music is... I love it. And yeah. it's so more and more these days, it seems to be what people are doing, you know? Yeah, you that's true, it. actually. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's why the stupid people keep saying jazz is dead. <laughs> it's like, no, it's not dead. It's <laughs> it's growing. That's what jazz is. <laughs> <Right. laughs> My friend Roland said uh, his 11-month granddaughter started moving in rhythm to the music. Oh, I love that. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. awesome yeah we and yeah. is your mother patty patty wedding that's my mom hi patty nice to meet you i don't think we've met maybe probably we maybe did maybe she remember. came to la or something possibly this feels i feel old now because i can't remember all of that and but, kate um, geller is here hi katie yay. uh she said, love being here with you both. Um, have you talked <laughs> about spontaneous composition and vocal improv yet? No. Oh. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Yes. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Kate Richards Geller is a real uh, big creator and supporter of that style. And um, she uh, has weekly gatherings. You can come get together and create with her which is really nice online I'm talking about yeah. um yeah <laughs> well I mean wow so the 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 awesome thing I mean we can't talk about this without talking about Rhiannon yeah right? yeah um Rhiannon's kind of brought all of us together yeah and I think my well, I mean, I, I don't know what I, I there's a lot to say. I mean, my journey with this started. Um, I mean, I I heard Bobby McFerrin with the Voices Trub back when I, I I spent one year at Western Michigan University, my freshman year of college, and he came with the Voices Trub. So I heard them, but th at that point, they were still performing most a lot of written music. Yeah. They were doing some improv, but it was, you know, and I, I guess I, I was in Rhiannon's presence, but I don't think I met her then. Yeah. But when I met her for the first time in New Zealand, we were both performing on the same jazz festival and she came to my gig, I think, and I went to her gig and her performance just freaked me out. <laughs> I mean, I was weeping and she did a, a version of Keith Jarrett's "My Song" with her, lyrics that she wrote. And I've I heard just, her sing that. Yeah. Oh my 
God, I just lost it. And then they had announced that she was doing a workshop the next day. So I was like, I'm going, you know, and I, (laughs) I went and it, freaked me out at first. Cause I remember the very first exercise we did was the crossing the circle exercise. Do you remember that one? Yes. Where you, the, basically the crossing the circle exercise is you you're standing in a circle and each person individually crosses the circle and your voice and your body are one. Basically, you know, you sing and you move at the same time. I don't know why I'm moving this way, but that's how I'm feeling. <laughs> and and I just remember we didn't have any, like nobody was singing underneath it. It was completely silent. And, and I just went, I can't believe I'm doing this, you know, and I did it. And it was like, Oh, this, it was very scary, but exciting. And then, you know, the whole workshop went on and I just fell in love with it. The concept of spontaneously composing and, and, Oh, you know, and afterwards, um, someone came up to me and said, what's happening you're like levitating, you're glowing, what is going on? And I said, I've got to do more of this. I've got to do more of this. And then I found out she was doing those, the, the Hawaii workshops. And I was like, I've got to go, I've got to go. I don't care what it costs. I'm going, you know, and I, I contacted them and, and it was full. And I just said, if anybody backs out, let me know I'm going, I don't care. I'm going. <laughs> and sure enough, a few days later, I got a, an email saying that someone had backed out and then that was the start of it. And so I went and and did the Hawaii thing. And I met some incredible people that are still in my life. It was one of those, you know, serendipitous, beautiful experiences when you go and you meet people for the first time, but you feel like you know them, that kindred spirit thing, you know, yeah. and making music with them. <clears throat> and it was also terrifying, but in a beautiful way, you know, because I hadn't ever improvised from that depth of my soul before, you know. And then I loved it so much that she was doing another, this is when she was doing a few of those a year. And I went back like four months later and went into debt. I didn't care. I just had to go back again. And then eventually Rhiannon came to, I I was teaching at Berkeley College of Music in Boston and Rhiannon joined faculty and she was teaching that class, which was awesome. And so the students were getting to experience spontaneous, she called it spontaneous composition. And then she ended up leaving Berkeley and she passed the class on to me. Um, and I was teaching that for many years, like eight, eight or nine years. That's something something. actually I didn't know. I didn't know she passed it on to you and and that you had been doing it for so long. Mm. Yeah. And then, uh, back to Kate Geller. Um, first of all, I just have to say how much I adore you, Kate, if you're still watching, (laughs) um, we had incredible spontaneous gatherings at her place for years and it it just yeah i i don't know i it it just has changed my life and and opened doors and meeting new people and so i taught that class at berkeley for quite some time and i'm excited to say that this upcoming semester i will be teaching it at frost school of music and working with students there for the first time doing this uh oh uh first time doing that class you mean at frost yeah because you've been at frost for a while right um this is only my second year at frost okay i was at berkeley for 11 years and then i i am now at frost so how did that transition happen did that was that um assisted by kate or yeah it it started um Now now we're talking about kate uh reed Kate Reed, woo! Yeah. Awesome. She is awesome yeah. in so many ways. And it is such an honor to teach with her. And we are so like minded. It's it's been we often laugh, like in vocal studio class, we laugh because she'll say something. I'm like, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> um I was performing at the Gen conference a couple years ago, and she came up and was talking about that there was a position coming open and, and I, I heard her and I thought, well, that would be interesting, you know, but I, I didn't know at that time, you know, whether I was going to move, you know, my time at Berkeley was interesting because I was a commuter the entire time I taught there from, well, first from New York, which was crazy because I either took the Amtrak or the Chinatown bus, which I had for a long time, 
people were saying that I needed to release a book about, you know, cause I had so many <laughs> stories. So I did that for a lot of, uh, quite a few years. And then I moved to Chicago for a couple of years. So I was flying every week from Chicago to Boston. And then my dad fell very ill and I moved back to Texas to help with him. And so I was flying every week from Austin oh, to Boston, which was Yes. Crazy. I know. Yeah, wow. That's that is. crazy. Um, but I didn't want to give that job up. I loved teaching there. Uh, I loved my students. I loved my peers and I loved that class. That class became like a family thing for me. It became, um, so much of it was not just me teaching the concepts that Rhiannon had taught me. And I, I'd come up with a few other exercises. It wasn't just about me teaching. It was them teaching me. And I really felt like it just became this family. And then Kenny Werner uh, was teaching effortless mastery. Yeah, and then he, he would often come, he would come in usually once a semester and we'd work together, which became oh, an all, also gosh. an amazing experience yeah. and having the vocalist do that. And, um, so I wasn't ready to give up the Berkeley experience. And then, uh, over time, you know, it just kind of evolved and I, I applied and I went for the interview and I got it and I couldn't believe it. And I moved to Miami <laughs> and it's just been a, it's been amazing so far. It's been amazing. Um, very different schools. Both of them are. Yeah really great i can't you know i can't say anything other than but i do frost is amazing because it's it's like a it's a little bit smaller it's a little more concentrated i get really a lot of hands-on experience with my students and i'm teaching a lot of things i'm teaching ear training uh -huh. um, i taught jazz piano last year um and i teach voice lessons of course i teach a small ensemble and last semester it was, we called, I called it woven because I, I felt that we were woven. And that was, um, we were doing kind of a mixture of, we decided to spend the semester honoring black American composers and musicians for last semester. So, but this time, this semester will be the spontaneous composition thing. So I'll be alternating those things. And I'm excited to see how, how we do it. I have not taught a class like that with social distancing. And I'm going to, I think that's going to be a challenge in some ways. Yeah. Um, but I'm up for the challenge because I think it's, it's going to be a great experience. I find that, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I know I'm hijacking this conversation. I'd love to hear your thoughts. No, that's okay. There's that stuff. It's mostly about you. <laughs> Believe it or not, even though I've been talking a lot, but yeah. But I've just found that this work um, has, it not only helps your improvisation and your musical skills, but it helps your human skills. Mm. And I, I had students that, I had one student that took my class um, three times at Berkeley because she, she was just coming out of horrible stage fright. And she found the work that we did helped her overcome it. And now it's so amazing wow. to watch her. Like she'll post something on Facebook or whatever. I'll see her performing and I'm like, wow, you would never know that she had stage fright. And I know that that class had a lot to do with it. And again, I don't take credit for that at all, but that, that, that atmosphere that we had and the, and the vulnerability and the bravery that it took to be vulnerable in that way. Yeah. Um, just really helped her out of that. So I had people that would take the the ensemble you know, or take the class a couple of, you know, a couple of times. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Because then you can really, you live with something. It's kind of like going through karma, karma, you know, you're working through uh, the stuff that you have to work through and then and, and releasing and coming, r rising up to the top. It's great. Right. What about how is that? work affected you like how how do you take it into your teaching and your yeah well i i think you're you it sounds like uh i i think that you have dove in a lot deeper but um i'm not sure i mean rianne definitely had oh opened up something for me 
And I had also been listening to other people like Jay Clayton. And, you know, I had been listening to, and I always enjoyed, um, to me, it's kind of like uh, even uh, like the cool jazz, like Miles and, you know, the West Coast jazz. That actually had an openness to it. Um, it wasn't it wasn't spontaneous creation, but in a way, you know, of course, within the form it was, but um, but it's still there was this uh, form and then freedom within it and space. I always I always was attracted to the space part, you know, <clears throat> because in the space you can always you can hear uh, you can see relationships and you can hear what just happened. And you can expect something happening. So, so space is really important. But um, of course, there was this uh, Rhiannon uh, workshop at the Blue Whale, <laughs> and um, there were people. I can't remember if Kate was there, but uh, you know, Cecily and Emil were there, and um, uh, I can't remember everybody who was there. But anyway there it was we had a great time we really just connected to that and then fish to birds was born you know right right oh, so yeah. fish to birds has been wor working i mean uh prior to the covid we were, we've been together like eight years so oh. that's definitely enhanced my singing um it made me able to be free and to yeah just all the things that when you practice that's that style you get better at right being free um spontaneous uh not not judgmental um kind of able to see like the river flowing you know so um and <clears throat> I haven't done that many classes on it, except for in schools like uh, at uh, LA College of Music. I'd be, you know, sitting in for somebody who was, who was doing that, and um, maybe it's helped me teach uh, teach soloing, you know, because it's it is that's what it is. Except soloing usually has the form in consideration too, the form of the song, right? Right. I think it's really important, though, and I think it's much more important than people give it credit for. Um, I'd like to see that coming to light more and more uh, in this period, actually, because I think I, I just think music has taken on a whole new meaning for people in this period, you know, this year. And I'd like to see improvisation actually uh, take on more importance, too, because we're improvising all the time. Right. You wake up, uh, you know, you're tired. You wake up, you're awake. You wake up, it's raining. You know, I mean, it's it's all improvisation, you know. Um, so I think it, it helps people to know that that's what life is and, and not look for perfection and solid mm -hmm. solidness to feel comfortable and being comfortable with their fears, you know, like as you, you said several times, you know, I was afraid or I was nervous or whatever. And, um, you know, be comfortable with that. It's like, okay, yeah, so fine. So I'm afraid. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. move on, you know. Yeah. It's such a, and it's just a really bonding experience, like the circle singing and stuff. Um, when I lived in Chicago, um, there's a beautiful singer named Davin Youngs, who is based in Chicago, who is now doing incredible work with um, looping. And he has some, he's doing some meditation and some podcasts, you know, I've done all kinds of stuff, but we, we had this company called Voxus mm. and we would take the circle singing into, um, businesses for like team building and we did a couple I of kind really of remember big, this yeah we uh. did a couple of really big ones like i remember we did a, a there was a company 
right. it was called JL or something. And there was like 170 financial people in the room and we walked in improvising and we did a presentation. He, he did a speaking presentation on about the power of the voice and whatnot, but we got them up in a circle singing at the end. And they were all like, they transformed from like, when we walked in, they were like, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, they had these looks on their face, <laughs> faces. And then at the end, they're like, you know, dancing and singing and giving each other high fives. And it was uh -huh. amazing to see, like, they became like little children again. And yeah. did that a few times. And it was just to watch the, these people who work together or kind of yeah. know each other. Yeah. This very straight laced. And all of a sudden at the end, they're, <laughs> you know, arms around each other. And it, it was just, very That's magical. great. I remember when that, when I became aware of that, and I thought, oh, that's so good, because I had often thought about, and I'm sure we were not the only people who eat, who, who considered that possibility, you know, um, and I remember my cousin, actually, who was a very spiritually minded person, and kind of a hands-on in business, ha and hands-on kind of improviser, she would go into companies and, you know, be hired for that and make big changes actually in the companies. And uh, so, and I, I know the companies, companies who think like that benefit from hiring something like that to open up their, their employees' minds, you know? Right. But so did that stop? The Voxes thing? Yeah. Well, I, I moved when I moved away, it kind of stopped. I, I still have hopes that maybe we'll do that again at some point. Um, yeah, it was it was great. I hope to do more of that. And I think that me doing the class now at Frost is going to light that spark again for me. To get you know, back, that's, back into that. that leads me into a question. Um, uh, I was I was overjoyed to hear that Kenny Werner when when I found out that Berkeley had created an, an effortless mastery department, <laughs> I was like, "What? That is unbelievable and amazing!" Um, and that's been six years or something, right? Something like that. Yeah, maybe. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Time is fun. Um, but so my question is. And for you too, since you have, you actually have classes, and you've you've had classes for a long time, and still do. Uh, how do you think that? Um, let's see, kind of. I'm not sure how to ask this. Realistically, I guess. Real. I hate using that word. I want to change change how I'm asking. Um, what do you think the students will walk away with from these classes? Do you think that they will use it directly like you and I would use it? Or or are they people who, are, who don't do what you and I do, but still use it? The, the spontaneous composition class, like that yeah, spontaneous improv? Yeah. Well, I think that I think that they'll use it. I mean, it, well, at, at Frost, most of them are going to be probably vocalists, but I'm hoping, and I've opened it up for other instruments. Um, at Berkeley, I had a few instrumentalists take it, which was great. I think, yeah, they can directly apply it to music, but like I, I think it applies to life too, because what I require of them, and I, I tell them this at the beginning, is the willingness to walk up to your creative edge and allow me to help you jump off that, you know? And that can apply so nicely to life, you know, when you actually learn that the reward comes when you take the chance, you know? For me, regret in life is when I don't do something. I have a couple of <laughs> big regrets musically that I just I thought I was making the right decision and I said no to and and then in the end it it must be right because I believe that that everything happens for I do believe everything happens for a reason and in hindsight at the end of my life I think I'll look back and go yep that was the, that happened the way it was supposed to but um the biggest regrets are when you don't jump in and I feel like 
doing this in this way helps people to do that, not only musically, but in their life as well. Um, and I just hope it helps. I think it also will help them with uh, body and voice connection because we do a lot of stuff in the body and connecting the body and the voice together. Because how many times have you watched someone perform on the stage and it's like there's the microphone or, you know, on the stand, they're behind it and they're trying to hide behind the microphone stand, which doesn't work, right? And, but you can tell that they're not embracing the space of the stage. They're not embracing the space of themselves on the stage, you know? And sometimes it, it takes digging in there and doing exercises to help break you free of that. Cause that's scary. That's a scary thing. I think for me, I don't know about you. Oh yeah, definitely. I I'm just thinking about Marlena Dietrich. You know, she actually used to, <laughs> she used to stand absolutely still in front of the mic on the stand and sing. But for her, it was different. It was a different experience because her artistry, her awareness, encompassed this huge space and she didn't have she she didn't feel like moving apparently and also she didn't have to to make an effect right it, right it was uh, it was her that made the effect you know but i agree with you i think that uh i i just um had on um moira smiley do you know her mm -mm. oh she's you would really like her you have to check her out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. More, uh -huh. more, more. Well, it's really Mora, but M O I R A. Moi it's spelled like Moira Smiley. And um she's a very eclectic person. She performs um she's a singer and writer and teacher and um she's um uh, well, I first saw her, <laughs> I think I first saw her perform, I, I feel like I had to have seen her before. But anyway, remember Billy Child's um, Map to the Treasure for Laura Nero? Uh, what a beautiful well, She was the demo singer, first of all, for, the, for all of those. And then he didn't even use her on the record. <laughs> and then at the Blue Whale, she performed, she was the only singer. Wow. And she did everything. And she's not exactly only, she's not really a jazz singer, but she's, um, she, you know, I mean, she's really incredible. Um, now, why did I bring her up? <laughs> we were talking well, about, well, we were talking about standing still or standing oh, like yeah. a prisoner behind so the mic stand. She really has a big comfort with herself. She, she has for years, she's, she's had to move she knows that about herself and <clears throat> it's great and it's very so it's very real and comfortable um and yeah i couldn't agree more and i i also see see it kind of from the other side too when people move in a way that is not comfortable it's not authentic right and that's yeah. that's the thing i i guess i wanted to say is that it's about being authentic yeah of course i mean you can see someone behind the mic standing completely still but there's something about their presence you know yeah. that they're being intentional and they're it's just there that's extremely powerful i wouldn't expect someone to move you know crazily yeah at, just to move but i'm just yeah. but there's also I'm, I'm i know you've seen it too it's like you see someone performing and you're like oh god they're not comfortable in their skin <laughs> i want to help them be comfortable in their skin you know <laughs> and that that might not mean moving per se but you, there's just a presence there's a there's a thing there yeah um, but i'll definitely check her out <clears throat> can you remind me can you remind me also the singer you said um that you loved the cinna eag which how, is how do you spell S it again S I N N E, uh huh, E E G. Okay, great. Yeah, right. and <clears throat> actually, I feel like uh, we should um, see maybe like, is there a, like a live YouTube of you? It would be really nice to have at least one live one of you. Yeah. Um, put in. This was from a few years back. Um. Oh wait, no wait. Uh, put in. Um, I, th there's a, well, gosh, there's a few things. Well, let's do the, let's do, um, carry on. If you put in carry on, 
Okay. Oh, that one right there. That do you see? Uh, it's third down yeah. right there. Yeah, yeah. This was a while ago, but this was me with Snarky Puppy. Oh, cool. Um, I'm impressed you sang with Snarky Puppy. I didn't actually know that. I toured quite a bit with them. They ended up what we would do. I would open up for them because I was on their label. That I loved the way Michael Lee did that. He'd have our, the other artists on the label open for them, so I got to do mm. a lot of traveling with them. But they would usually end up playing on my set. It would either just be the you know members of the band or just oh. me and Michael would would play. You know, that's that would be a bucket list thing for me singing with Snarky Puppy because, I mean, <laughs> Snarky Puppy. You know, I mean, God. <laughs> So amazing, amazing group of musicians. And amazing wow. people. Amazing people. Really, really. Michael League is one of the most incredible human beings, I think. Just a great musician and a great heart and really loves music and loves, you know, the other artists. And they are also the hardest working band I think I've ever seen. So yeah. I love seeing their success has been, it's just been really lovely to see. Yeah. Okay, here's Allison with Snarky Pup.
Oh, nice. Beautiful. Thank you. Is that a, is that your song? Yes. Nice. Uh, I Will Rebound. Is that the title? It's called Carry On. Ah. Yeah, the, the, it was basically about, yeah, becoming like a phoenix, re rebounding after, you know, some tough times. I guess it would be very appropriate for <laughs> an anthem for 2021. Definitely. <laughs> I will rebound. I yeah. will rebound. I will carry on. I will rebuild this wreckage from the bottom up. I will redefine the quest of never giving up. Oh, nice. Thank you. What are you working on right now? <laughs> um, well, I'm actually releasing singles. Oh, wow. I've released three singles since like May. And um, I had a, uh, <clears throat> well, one, two of the singles are from a new record that I had been, I had uh, two bands. Uh, you probably know some of the players. Um, one band was Josh Nelson, Anthony Wilson, Edwin Livingston, and Lorca Hart. And then the other band was um, Nick Mancini, Will Brom, Steve Haas, um, Alec Bonham, and uh, Carrie Frank. And so anyway, we, uh, we, I, I uh, took music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s, <laughs> the songs that I really liked, and... Um, I had them, I, the music was already done, the instrumental stuff. And, mm -hmm. but then I snuck in a project, a straight ahead project, which, you know, it was the first straight ahead project I'd ever done actually. And I had started it seven years ago in England. So the basic project was done. And I even had Norma Winstone on one of the cuts. But, um, so uh, we got that and we, uh, we actually, with John Leftwich, we kind of reproduced it and added a few people, and I did some vocals over, and, and so we put that out in the interim. So right now, I, I wanted to feel like you. I wanted to kind of experiment with releasing singles and what that was about. The, you know, it's not, for me, it's not that different than releasing a CD in many ways. The one thing is, is that uh, the review, uh, well, first of all, radio is, um, they're not inclined to play singles. They're, they, uh, they want to, they'll play a song from a cut on your record. And reviewers also, although I have found one reviewer who, I love his writing anyway, and he happens to love me. So it's really nice to get, I can actually get a review of my singles. So that's wonderful. But um, <clears throat> the thing that I do like about it, besides the fact that it's, in a way, it's cheaper. It's not cheaper overall, but it's cheaper at the in the moment, right? Uh -huh. <clears throat> and um, especially if you have, like me, if you have all the instrumentals done already, I just go in and fix up my vocals and then, bing, I'm finished. But um, the thing that I do like about it, which... I think is real valuable as far as marketing goes is that you're you can always be in the light you know like you know how it is when you release a record and it's like wow ah, this record's coming and it's released and then next week nobody even thinks about it right yep <laughs> so that's like frustrating for artists yes. but this yes. releasing singles uh i've released a, the singles like every few months every two months or so and so people are always like, oh, oh, it's Kathy again, um, you know, and, um, and the, so I like that aspect of it a lot, I, because it's, you're always out there a little bit, you know, so again, I feel somebody like me, um, you know, I'm one of the many jazz musicians who are never going to be thoroughly world known as far as you know on the lips of every person who loves jazz even you know um but uh but i'll have a number of people who are fans and who do like it and who will hear it once and go oh wow that's cool who's this you know so you know that just kind of continues that process you know 
That's so great. Yeah, now you're inspiring me to do the single thing even more. Yeah, I, I think it's, like I said, I'm watching, uh, there's a former student of mine who's just a beautiful singer and songwriter and plays guitar and um, she, I'm really, it's interesting watching her career develop and, and how she does it. And a lot of it is she'll do, um, on Instagram, she'll just do like, you know, the little minute long, yeah. I think you can do like a minute long regular video and then you can go to IGTV but, or whatever, yeah. but she'll just do a little minute long thing. And sometimes she'll record herself uh, doing background vocals for herself and then play along and sing with that. Just do a little snippet here and then she'll, she'll say, oh, you know, I've got a, a single coming out soon and she does, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, she's really taken off and it's been so uh. cool to watch that. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, I, I, we have such short attention spans anymore, unfortunately, due to these lovely smartphones and, and all that <laughs> stuff. It's yeah. kind of been a curse, but in a way you got to cater to that. Right. And I guess the singles is the way to do that. Like you said, you can release if you, and I, are you going to release your singles as a as an album at some point like yeah will you um, right yeah and also the other thing i've been doing which i think is extremely effective as well because of what you just said is i've been making iMovies to go along with them so i will go and pick the images and then put them together what one, one of the three um my social media guy actually put it together and you know with some back and forth editing, but I picked the images. So that's another, and it's another creative process, which is really nice. You know, I listen to it and then I I go looking on the web for the photos and, and that are dictating it, the, the song is dictating what I'm picking, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, where do I put them? How do I fade them in and out? That That's a really, I do enjoy that a lot, but I think it's, I think it's really good. I think it's even better than just audio oh for sure yeah the, vis the visual thing yeah it's yeah definitely a good thing to have. um that's another thing by the way about uh um moira she's done some amazing <laughs> she did this one um this year she put out this song something about war song of war or something with this um cartoon you know that was all the way through it and this first of all the song was great. Beautiful song. Second of all, this cartoon thing was amazing. I just cried through it. And I found out this week that the per the person who did the cartoons was 14. What? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, wow. how can that even be possible? How does somebody like that even create? You know, I mean, it was it was a totally effective. And um, yeah, you're gonna have to check that out. But I do think that, um, and then as far as what gets picked up and noticed by the crowds, it's kind of the same, it's the same issue that you and I have been dealing with for years, you know, it's like, who knows? I don't know, I'm, you know, somebody, you know, like you said, uh, Rhiannon, was it somebody saw you? Oh, who you, you mentioned that somebody saw you singing and, that was, oh, it, at, in Australia, right? They saw you singing or they heard you on the show. And then they, you were offered a record contract from that. So you never know. You just, you have to keep doing what you do and you put it out and you put it out ethically and well and, and then things happen. You know, actually talking to so many people, you, you are number 223. <laughs> but, um, wow. Talking to all these people, I can't tell you, I mean, it makes sense to us, but it's just, it still blows my mind how people keep saying the same thing like that. They just, they did what they did and they were in the moment, in the moment somebody came along and picked up, you know, and then it picked up and then it went on and they continued working together and, and then whatever. They got famous or they were successful. What what's your I what is your description of success? Uh, that's a great <laughs> question. Wow. And I think that 
it has somewhat changed over the years for me. I mean, there would have been a time where I thought if I won a Grammy, that would have meant I was successful. Yeah. And I still, that, that would be a very cool thing, um, for sure. Sure. But I think... For me, success is like really loving what I'm doing and being able to live and not be freaking out every day about bills. I mean, that sounds really frank, but. Well, no, that's, I mean, but that is so true. Like for me, it's not about, I don't know, the, the whole fame thing. And you and I talked about this before we started, and I'll, I'll talk about it again. I'm realizing more and more every day that I am an introvert that is extroverted. I, I can go to a party and I can talk to anybody. I can have a conversation with anybody, but there is a part of me that is just, uh, is quite shy and, and quite afraid to push myself and push, you know, and talk about my accomplishments and, and I think that that is a necessary, that's a necessary thing to be able to do in this world today, you know, to, to have the confidence to, you know, to be on social media and, and, and know what to do. And, and it's so great that you have somebody that you're working with on the social media thing. Yeah. Um, but I feel like I, I look back on my, on my life so far and I mean, I'm, it's not over, right? It's never over. <laughs> no. But I feel like part of my, where I'm at right now has to do, some of it has to do with my fear. I think, I really do. I think that I didn't do some of the things that I could have done, partly because I enjoy my, I enjoy being alone some of the time. And I, uh, I, I, I've been, I've toured all over and, and it's very, wonderful but there's also parts of that that i obviously you know i think if i really loved it so much all the, and i wanted to be on the road all the time i'd probably be doing that well not right now but um but yeah for success for me like my ideal success would be you know teaching continuing to teach and and just watching students and former students living their dream that I can't tell you what that does to me. I love it. It, it, I, I am also really good at promoting other people. I wish I was as good about promoting myself as I am about promoting other people, but it makes me feel so excited to see people blossom and to know that I had, was a little bit of a, a stepping stone in there, or maybe I gave them a little shove or whatever. Um, that to me is success. Uh, having somebody write me and say, I really want to perform one of your tunes. That blows my mind. I'm like, are you serious? Really? (laughs) I would be honored for you to perform one of my tunes. You know, that, that to me feels successful. Um, and anytime someone reaches out and says something nice, that it it could be the littlest thing. Um, and if fame ever came from that, that would be cool, I guess, but that's just not what it's about for me anymore. Yeah. What about you? Well, I I mean, of course, the same stuff. And it just, uh, the idea of fame, I was just listening to Marianne Williamson, um, her, you know, she does the Course course of Miracles. Course of Miracles. Mm -hmm. So um, fluid in her speaking. Talk about spontaneous, you know. I mean, I know she kn- she knows a lot about it, and she's probably thought about what the subject is. But then it's like she's prolific, you know. And um, I was just checking it out yesterday, and um, she was talking about um, <laughs> she talked about how it was okay to be here if you actually knew you weren't really from here talking about mm-hmm. the planet earth <laughs> mm-hmm. and i just i that just amused me so much it was like yeah yeah that's right you know because we get so distracted um by uh by things like fame being success 
uh, and that, I, I, I mean, I wonder if you spoke to somebody who was super, like a super famous actor or something, if they would actually say that that's what they would consider success. Probably not, you know, because they're probably, they're probably really loving what they're doing. And they, I have a feeling that's what, that's what they really consider success. Sometimes I think on the other side of it, like if you're not famous or you're not doing what you want to do and you're you have that as a carrot sitting out there you may th assign success to that but when but after the fact you know when you are um doing what you want to do and maybe being noticed or you know able to continue then you actually realize oh success is doing what i do well and enjoying it you know, and like you said, paying the bills. I mean, if I was yeah. doing what I loved and I was still, you know, getting ready to get thrown out of my house, I probably would not feel so successful, you know. Right. I wonder if that's even possible, though. I think if we're truly connected, I don't know, I'm getting a little existential here. But no, that's okay. I think if we're really connected like that and we really, really do love, I think there it's really impossible it not, yeah, it can't know. fail and and another thing as you were speaking for me true success would also be hand in hand with me being able to live in the present moment always mm -hmm. and to me that is the secret of feeling true joy yeah. and true contentment and i am not great at it i will tell you but i have had moments of it and I remember the first time I felt that feeling, I was living in New York and I was taking, at that time I was teaching at Berkeley a couple of days a week and then I taught at Queens College as well. And it would take me a good couple of hours to get to Queens College uh, on the subway. And I remember I was reading a book, it was probably it might have been Marianne Williamson or Wayne Dyer, someone like that, who I absolutely love them. <laughs> and reading a concept and just sitting there and feeling like in that moment that there was just so much joy in that little moment. And I felt like I was truly in the moment. And I was like, wow, what a gift it is to be here. And I just felt a buzzing like, oh my gosh, is this what enlightenment is? And then I, you know, I, I snap out of it, you know, of course, and I'm worried about something else. Because I'm, I am the queen of worrying and I stress. But I do know that when I'm truly in the present moment, like right now, what could be better? I'm sitting here talking to an old friend that I haven't seen in a long time, talking about life and music what could be better right i mean this is truly a joyful successful moment to me yeah. so i think it's all if we can stay in the present moment and be doing what we love and and be aware then you're you know like aware of what could be happening like somebody might call and be like oh you want to co-write and then you know just being there in the moment and and going and seeing where what happens to me that's success and i still strive I strive daily for that feeling. But you know, that's, uh, I, I, first of all, yes, <laughs> I agree. Second of all, um, I just want to say that there's no need to uh, really worry or not worry, but there's no need to kind of feel like uh, you haven't achieved the pinnacle because you're still sliding away from being in the moment because everything is uh is the lesson and what it is it's everything and and i'm not the only person who said that i mean read eckhart tolle and he says that mm -hmm. all the time you know pema chodron you know they mm -hmm. say that it's like you know everything is part of it it's not just the good stuff it's the bad stuff too, and so it's all it's all part of the the uh, the makeup of the cloth that we're that we're in, and the the work to stay aware. I mean, that's of course that's why we like to perform, and especially jazz, but it can be in any style. But that's why we like it because it brings us there. I always said jazz. To me, it's like a religion because it's yeah. something that you practice that brings you closer to the 
to God, you know. So, um, yeah, and <clears throat> so, yeah, I think it's it's uh, being in the moment is something and being aware. I think those two things are pretty crucial to to remember to keep working to keep working towards and uh, and being there. Um, yeah, and and when you realize that you're not as accomplished in a particular thing as you would like to be, then again, it's like a karmic thing, right? You work until until you uncover that layer, that last layer, whenever it ha happens. It could be in a minute or it could be in a year, um, you know, and you can you can rise to the top again. Yeah, for sure. Um, you were the first, uh, you were the first, am I correct, the first vocal jazz student at in Texas? At the university? I was one of I was one of like three. Was yeah. was Gretchen Parlato one? At, at, no, not at, not at UNT. No. Okay. Um, wow, that was a long time ago. A long time ago, and a really great experience that really kicked me in the butt. Because at that point, that program there now is so great. Um, Isn't Jennifer that where Burns and, Jennifer Burns? Jennifer Burns and Rosanna Eckert. Oh yeah, Rosanna. That, I mean that that department has just been has really taken off. But at that point, when I was there, they didn't really know what to do with us. Yeah. So we kind of got lumped in with the instrumentalists, which ended up being a really great thing. Um, and I, I've talked about this a few times, but I was taking an improv, one of the improv classes. I was the only vocalist in it. It was one of the advanced improv classes and Fred Hamilton was teaching it. And he really made an impact on me at multiple reasons. But I, I will never forget one day we were working on, we were working on Coltrane, Monk, and Wayne Shorter tunes. And I think we were working on Giant Steps at the time, which was terrifying as a vocalist. <laughs> yeah, just sure. Just over that. Yeah. And I remember we were going around the room and you know everybody was soloing and here i am the vocalist and <laughs> he he saw the look of terror on my face and he said you know everyone put your instruments down and they, everyone put their instruments down and then he's like we're gonna sing today oh god and it huh. was it was such a wow. transformative class on many many ways first of all i think the the instrumentalist finally understood that it's not quite the same. Yeah. You know, I don't have buttons to push. Yeah. You have to, as vocalists, in order to really carve through changes, you have to be able to hear and control. You know, it's a vocal control thing. We hear it. We have to place it. It all happens quickly, but it's not just, you know, I can sit at the piano and play a solo for you. It won't be great, but I can, I can theoretically know what's going on. And I, I hit a note and that note is there. I don't have yeah. to hear it first. I don't have to tune it. <laughs> now, not obviously, not all instruments are like that. I mean, yeah. fretless instruments and whatnot. They, you know, and a lot of and trombone and I mean, there involves yeah, yeah, this type of thing. But it was just a great experience, and I felt very seen and uh -huh. very heard by him that day, and it made such an impression on me. At his teaching made an impression on me and I never forgot that ever, ever, ever. And I take that into my teaching. Now I strive for that. It's like those little things, you know, and it, it really helped them to see me. It helped me to see them. It helped, you know, and everybody on the, at that point that on that day was on a level playing field. Yeah. And I did, I wasn't, I didn't feel so lame in that class that day. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. And, um, well, well, that's saying, that's saying a lot that that you you took it took from there. Now, I'm sorry, I have to play, and I love him because okay. it's one of my favorite Allison wedding performances. And um, but after that, there was a really interesting record that you did in New York that you had a GoFundMe for that um, I contributed to and because I'm an Allison Wedding fan and that I'd like to talk about that too because that that was a really 
I think that was a really interesting project. Um, <clears throat> do you think that it's on YouTube and I Love Him? It should be there. Okay. If not, I can. <clears throat> and I Love Her? Is it do called I, her? Do I, do I and I Love Him? I changed. Okay. I think it's uh, okay. Be there it is. It. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna blow the surprise, but okay. <laughs> you'll hear, you'll hear what I heard first, and I went, what? Oh, oh my gosh. <clears throat> what I'm about oh. to show you is gonna change it. Sorry. <laughs> Lovely ads, YouTube ads. <laughs> Give him all my love, that's all I do. And if you saw my love, you'd love him too. He gives me. Tenderly, the kiss my lover brings, he brings to me a love like ours will never die as long as I. stars that shine dark is the sky i know this love of mine will never
Yeah. Well, that's one of my favorite all-time cuts. It's like a desert island song for me. So Thank beautiful. You. Thank um, you. So obviously, my big my big thing was you didn't sing, and I love him until the very end, which was it it would it made so much sense. It was so beautiful. The song was totally beautiful without that. Um, and the, another thing I just noticed, uh, especially was. You know, um, uh, vibrato is uh, such an interesting addition to a voice. And uh, normally, although I've been guilty of it too, um, I don't like vibrato all the way through the voices, unless it's a supernatural experience, you know. Um, but your vibrato is really quite beautiful. It's very... Uh, it brings in what what you would hope vibrato would bring into it. It you know emotion. It's really quite beautiful. Thank you so much. Wow. Oh. It's so interesting listening back yeah. to this. Yeah. Um. And and hearing it, and it's also nice to be able to listen to it and not be like, oh god, why did I do that? <laughs> and to, to go like, okay, because this was a long time ago now. The, yeah. The, this album, this album came out in oh my gosh, I'm s hello. It came out in 2003, I think. What? So it's interesting to hear that you know my voice has gotten darker and deeper as I've gotten older. Yeah. Just to hear what I did and and hear the band and it, you know I the one thing I love about music that is just such a gift is the ability for it to transport you to another time in like that yeah. and it's just like I was sitting there going oh you know and remembering Belinda coming up with the that do 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 you know that line and just yeah. how wonderful that was and I was probably I don't know if we collectively decided to hold off on the chorus until the end I don't remember whose idea that was I I can't take credit I don't know if it was my idea or if it was hers yeah but just that you know thinking back on that process as a band and working together and the funny stories the really ridiculous <laughs> stories of the tour <laughs> can i share one it's sure. so funny oh my <laughs> gosh so we had our tour manager was named hank van lewen who is still around he um is from amsterdam and uh but he was a great tour manager and and he had booked us but we had this one gig and I can't even remember what town it was in, but it was in a very, not not like one of the big cities at all. And um, we were playing in the town hall kind of thing, and it it was like a desert town, and and I just remember thinking, gosh, you know, are people coming to this gig? Like this, who is coming to hear us? Like I, you know, and it, I was thinking, God, are we going to be playing to an empty house? And and I remember I was in the you know, getting ready backstage and he came in and he was like, okay, you know, five minutes till showtime. And I said, how many people are here? Like, and he goes, oh, it's good. You know, 40 or 50. And I was like, really? Okay. Well, he was lying, of course. <laughs> so we're, we go out and the band goes out and starts to play the tune and I came out and I walk out and I look out and there's five people in, in the audience. And I just, I started laughing. So I had to turn around and look at the band and I was like, just keep playing. And I'm like laughing because I, I couldn't believe we were playing to five people in this big hall. You know, like nobody came, nobody knew. Know. And it was like a government funded kind of game. But oh my gosh, I, it was the funniest thing. And I just told him after I was like, you are, on, you are on my list, man. You know, it was really funny. And we had a great gig, but it was for literally like, maybe it was like eight people, but not a lot of people were there. It's funny. But just again, you know, hearing that brought me back to that moment. <laughs> that's, that's funny, actually. Yeah. Those moments on the road. Um, hey, Benjamin May is here. What? Wow. Hey, Ben. 
Yeah, he said he still has the recording of For All We Know and the Meaning of the Blues, and that was great. And he hopes you're well. Oh, hi, Ben. I hope (laughs) you're well, too. I hope he's playing a lot. Well, given the circumstances. Yeah, but he's playing at home, I'm sure, because he's... It seems he strikes us as the kind of person who amuses himself really well, and he plays great piano and great bass. So, man, yeah. I remember one of my regular gigs in L.A. Ben played bass on. I can't yeah. remember the hotel that was though. I I'm sorry, my memory is really odd. Sometimes I remember very specific things, and then I can't remember things that would seem so obvious. Well, you might have played at Lowe's with he, he and his brother. Yes. Yeah. I just yelled that. Yes, that was it, I think. (laughs) Yes, the fabulous May brothers, who I did lots and lots of gigs with, Stephanie Haynes and I. And uh, yeah, yep. In fact, I remember when I met them. I met them at the the old jazz club Chadney's in Toluca Lake, where Sarah Vaughn used to hang out. A whole bunch of people played. And I remember the night I met them, actually. Two brothers, incredibly... um, interesting you know and smart and fun and um yeah i remember that really well yeah <laughs> um he said he has a gig on saturday oh, wow. <laughs> At, was, oh yeah yeah safe. those were the days man and his 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 uh brother dave was a really good bass player as well uh he was he was very good too and uh, of course, Dan was extremely talented, and yeah. Um, let's see, something else. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh yeah, Roland said those five people were real fans. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It only takes five people, and sometimes, sometimes those are the most nerve-wracking gigs. I, I don't know. For me, oh, performing yeah. in front of just a select few is a lot different than performing in front of, you know, thousands of people. Oh, um, yeah. If you, if the, yeah, the audiences, if the, if you have a thousand people in the audience, it's kind of easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there are this kind of big mass and, <laughs> and yeah, it's really easy. People always say that. Um, I did a gig a few weeks back. Um, at um, the LA, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the LA Athletics Club, and mm-hmm. <coughs> I had a trio. I had Admar Ruiz on piano and Carrie Frank on B three, and Aron Seferty on drums. They were <coughs> the only people in the audience. <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. Were um, were the tech people. So there was maybe 12, 10, something like that of them. And um, uh, and then there, it was streamed. Oh, but, <coughs> excuse me, it was really fun, you know. Um, but I was really in the mood to sing and connect with people, you know. Yeah. And um, that, that energy that you feel. Yeah. And the. But I do also believe that, I mean, more than ever, it's just to be able to connect with those five people is such a great thing. You can make a real big difference in someone's life. You know, it only takes one person hearing it. But yeah, but the the energy of being in a room with other people and, oh, yes, I miss it. I miss it. I miss it. I miss it. Um, do you remember... <laughs> What was that club called in LA? Ca del Sol? Yes, I, I booked it. bar. I booked That's it. That's where I think I first met you. Oh. There. But I remember I did a gig there, and I can't remember. Of course, I can't remember the pianist at, at the moment. I can't remember his name. But I had been sick, and I was thinking of this because of you were coughing, and I, I remember I had had some sort of upper respiratory infection and I was singing. And of course, you know, that club was so exposed because it's just you and the pianist yes. and the bars around you and everybody's there. And it's like, wow, you, you know, nowhere to go anything, <laughs> you do anything wrong. And people know, and I had been sick and I had to cough in the middle of a ballad. 
And I started coughing. And I just remember he was looking, he was playing beautifully, just looking at me kind of going, oh my God. And I just had the coughing fit. And people were like, oh, you know. And then I just, <clears throat> and just started singing again. It's like, what do you do, right? Yeah. It's a natural function. The vocal folds are trying to save my life right now. I'm going to let them do their thing. And Well, I have this chronic cough that I've had for 20 years. So um, it's uh, the only thing that I found that stops my coughing is Vocal Zone from England. And um, it doesn't cure my coughing. It stops it. Um, and I've tried many, many, many things, Eastern and Western medicine and... Um, yeah. So when I'm singing or just now, like when I'm talking and it just comes on, uh, you know, why does it come on? Why did it come on? I don't know. I've been drinking the drink that I've been drinking for two hours and water, you know, had a little coffee earlier, you know, so there's nothing changed in my room, you know, so there's, it's, uh, it is what it is. It's something that you have to go through. And I'm sure I'm not the only person and lots of people. I mean, Peggy Lee had asthma. That's why yeah. she's saying like that. So anyway, you just do what you've got to do, you know. Vocal zone. I wrote that down. Yeah. It, you don't have to pay more than five or six dollars on Amazon for it because it, it comes from England. But um, okay. yeah, it's um, <clears throat> there. Yeah. In fact, Judy Silvano, once I was talking with her about it, she she said she always has one in her mouth when she's singing. <laughs> So um, a lot of a lot of singers use it. It's good. I found it when when I was in England. Luckily, unbelievably, I, I don't even know what I would have done otherwise. You know, all, all these years because I've been using them for years. <clears throat> um, so um, let's see. Did did you have a did did you have siblings? I do. And are they have... as well? <clears throat> Uh, not really. Well, my brother, so I have a brother and a sister. They're yeah. both, um, well, quite a bit younger than I am. My brother is about nine years younger than I am. And my sister's about 15 years younger than mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. Both, they're adopted. Um, my brother could, <coughs> could sing. I think they both could sing, but they don't, they never did anything. <coughs> right. But my brother, my brother definitely had a really nice voice. Um, and he, I now have two nephews, and one, my, the older, uh, Brandon, really, I just when I was home recently, he was singing, and I was like, wow, man, like, this kid can sing. Like, he's got great pitch huh. and <clears throat> a beautiful tone, so I'm curious to see what happens there. He's, he's about, I think he's seven now, um, but I'm curious to see what happens with that. But yeah, my, my brother could sing. I think my sister could sing too, but they, they explore different things. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, with my grandchildren, I have, especially with one, the older girl who's eight, um, we've actually Im improvised, done like pieces of improvisation together. And she just jumps right in. She's really, she's really cool with it, you know. <clears throat> it's really fun to do that with them i'd never had kids so and you haven't either right nope so it's really just, interesting just, having just dogs <laughs> look at that dog <laughs> he's been sitting on my lap this whole time oh. <laughs> he's adorable <laughs> <laughs> um yeah but watching children you know act and uh interacting with them and <clears throat> It's really fun. I don't see how anyone can not improvise, you know, um, when you have little little people around you. Yeah, we have a lot to, to learn from that. I mean, that's kind of what I was talking about with the with the class, like in working with people with the spontaneous improvisation stuff. It almost requires you to be like a child because they're not afraid. Yeah, they're not. They don't care what you think when they're doing that. <laughs> Yeah, right? and, and look at the, the things they come up with, and it's so much fun. And if we could get back to that again, you know, it would be pretty cool. Hey, Not so talk about that. talk about that project in New York. Oh yes, so that was the one that was on the Ground Up label. Okay. Um, oh. I did the I did the Kickstarter for that. Yeah. That was kind of early on in the whole Kickstarter thing. Yeah. Um, and 
uh, Michael League was in my band, and he had, he was the one that said, "Do you want to release an album on our label?" And I was like, "Well, oh, yeah, sure," you know. And uh, <clears throat> just going back to him for a second, as far as the producer thing, and why I said he's an amazing human being. I mean, he really was a great producer in the sense that he understood what, what I wanted, which was, it was what good producers, yeah. right? Yeah. That's what they, he understood it and, but yet could take it to a place that I didn't quite have in my head already. Yeah. So he took it and went with it. Um, yeah, it was, <clears throat> it was a process that recording too, because in the middle of that recording, I had a vocal trauma. Wow, gosh, bringing all this back. I had um, a hemorrhage in my vocal fold and had to have surgery. Mm. And um, it was a shock to me and a shock to everyone because I'm not a screamer. I don't, you know, I, I've always been, technique has always been very important to me. And, and I realized that that doesn't matter. And I know why I got it. And that's why I, I do not take ibuprofen and I highly recommend any singer watching this be very, very careful with ibuprofen. It weakens the blood vessels and can cause hemorrhaging. Mm. Um, but that was, so th there was a big process throughout that entire project, the starting of it, then having to stop in the middle and, and have the surgery and get over that. Um, and then how did you know, by the way, that you had that? Did did it hurt, or did you not be no. able to sing? Or I remember I was teaching at Berkeley one day and doing a demonstration for a student and playing, and I just noticed around it was around F five on the piano. F five. It started to feel like an effort to sing up there. And it normally wasn't. So I was a, I was certainly aware of what it normally felt like. It felt like, I don't know if you've ever had a stretch of period where you didn't sleep. Yeah. And then you tried to sing. Like, not sleeping is the, the death of me as a singer. I, I can almost cope with everything, but if I don't sleep well, I have a hard time. And I just remember going, God, this is just, I felt exhausted. Just like, that's such an effort. And it, it just didn't feel right. And so I went and had a scope, and sure enough, he showed me the, the image and it was terrifying to see these, you know, what should be white vocal folds. And one of them was completely red oh, wow. blood under the surface. And I was like, what caused this? Oh, you know, and immediately you start to doubt everything. And, and he said, well, just watch it. They gave me some steroids because I had some gig coming up and I was fine. And then I, then I got sick and I had a cough. And of course, you know, when you cough, the vocal folds yeah. slam against each other. And then I, it happened again. And then I, the, my doctor was like, you know, you need to think about, we need to get in there and get this blood vessel taken care of. And I was too scared, but I got a bunch of different opinions. And then, then it ruptured one more time. And then that was it. I had to, and it was from sneezing. Yeah. I was, I was just, I sneezed and then my voice was gone. I was like, wow, this, yeah, this can't. So yeah. I had very successful surgery. Hmm. Um, and he, with a cold knife, got that vessel out of there and and it's knock on wood never been an issue again and i've been healthy uh, every scope i've had i knock on wood but i you know what else it's i'm thankful for that that lesson and that that experience because it's helped me with students i'm able to i hear i can hear a lot of times that there's a pathology i don't know what it is i'll always encourage someone to get a scope um but I think the the stigma around vocal injury is ridiculous and it's not always because you're a screamer and it's not always because you have bad technique. A lot of times it has nothing to do with that. It could be circumstantial. It could be other health things going on. And, and I think that, you know, when a football player tears a hamstring, people don't shame him, <laughs> you know? And I, I think that the vocal injury thing, there shouldn't be a stigma attached to that. Now, does that mean you shouldn't have good t technique or work toward that? Of course not. But, you know, so that's helped me a lot with talking about the importance of vocal health with my students because I lived it and it was terrifying. Yeah. And that week after the surgery when I couldn't speak, 
the thoughts that went in my head, will I ever sing again? What's that going to be like if I can't sing again? What instrument, you know, am I going to pick up another instrument instead? Will I be happy with not being able to sing? That was a terrifying week, you know? Yeah. Dina DeRose went through something like that. She couldn't play piano. And uh, I can't remember exactly what happened to her, but that's why she started singing more. Wow. Um, so, so back to the project. So oh. the project is, uh, is, all, wasn't it all of your writing? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, it reflected a particular moment in time for you, right? Uh-huh. Um, the album I had dedicated to my friend, Will Poskett, who was <sighs> stunning pianist in Australia that, um, had died so the for will was for him and i decided to dedicate the whole project to him and um yeah i mean those songs all of my songs well not all of them a lot of the songs i write are about me and or some point in my life and it doesn't necessarily mean i'm going through that at that very moment but i do occasionally write songs though that have nothing to do with me, that have been things that I've observed, but because of my own experience, I can put myself in there and feel it again. Yeah. Um, but that project, yeah, it was it was really special. Like I said, it had, we had strings, um, guitar. I played piano on a couple tracks. I played Rhodes on a track. Um, we had percussion, but no drum kit, mm. which was super interesting. And then having the guest artists, I mean, Chris Potter came in and did two takes and I liked both of them. I mean, it it was just whatever, you know, Oh my God. (laughs) And Lionel came in and played carry on and brought his thing to it. And Theo, I mean, I was lucky to call those people friends, but wow, the, the musicianship there and, and various people from the snarky group, Keita, Ogawa, who's a beautiful percussion player, brought so much to it. And um, I'm very proud of that album. It was... What was the name of that one again? It was called This Dance. Right. It's hard hard to find it right now. I think it's... It might be on CD Baby still. Um, I have plenty of copies if anybody wants one. (laughs) You heard Um, it it here, folks. It was on (laughs) iTunes. I did not put that on Spotify. I fought for that not to be on Spotify. I was very anti-Spotify at that time, and I still, in some ways, am. However, it can be a great tool to learn about new music, but I, I really do aim to, I buy pretty much every bit of music that I listen to. Um, and I was just super frustrated with that machine and how they weren't paying artists what, you know, paying someone 0.009 cents per stream is just not okay. Well. Um, but I, in some ways I regret it not being up there because a lot, you know, a lot of people might not have heard it. I could probably get it back up there again. Yeah. I guess. Um, but yeah. It was My friend so- Roland wants one, so. Oh, you, okay. <laughs> you go, I'm sure you could go to her website and get her um, contact, right, from your website? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, yep. <laughs> Roland always jokes with me. He's like, he's always, almost every time I have this, and he's here, and he's always buying. He's very supportive. Oh, <laughs> and Dan Davila too. Usually people end up with at least two sold. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, well, you, it's been two hours. What? It's crazy, isn't it? That went by so fast. I know. It feels like <laughs> maybe an hour, right? Right. Wow. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, I hate to, um, I mean, I, it's not a hard stop, but anything you want to say to the to the listeners here? First of all, I just want to say thank you to you for having me. And this has thank been amazing you. to connect with you again and yeah. and have these conversations. I could, I could talk like this for days. <laughs> Me too. Um, <laughs> and I just thank everyone that listen, you know, that's been here with us and listening. And um, yeah, let me know if you want to hear any music if you can't find it. And 
And I also would be interested in hearing yours if you have anything to share. Um, All right. Yeah, just thank yeah to thank everyone for being here. It's really yeah. this is really special, and I'm so glad you're doing this, Kathy. It's really awesome. Thanks, Allison. So, um, what should people be looking for for you? Like, what's coming out next? Well, the the children's music. If you have kids or you have any relatives that are younger, you know, be on the lookout for um, a book called The Zoo and a song called The Zoo and um, The Zibbets. You might might be like, what's that? But that's um, the little group that we we call ourselves the Zibbets, but they're also it's also a really cool little character, a little group of alien looking characters that go on this these adventures with people too and so be on the lookout for that i'm really excited about that i'm hopefully uh that will come out sometime in the spring and again i'm just going to be working on right i'll I'll still be writing and recording and trying to get out this solo project where i'm playing and singing uh my original stuff that i i've got a ton of stuff that i've never recorded so Hopefully, cool. I will be able to get that to the point where I feel okay enough to release it out into the world. <laughs> <laughs> you will. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> you will definitely <coughs> achieve that. Um, it's been a real joy. I love love you. I love talking I love to you and too. hearing what you're doing. And um, yeah, people are very lucky to have you as a teacher. And uh Thank you. Have a have a really lovely evening. Thank you. You too. <laughs> it's coming along. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to tell you that next week, Stacy Hoffman's going to be on Monday. You know, it's um, she was the director of Jazz Camp West. Oh, cool. Yeah. Nice. And which has changed its name. I think it's called Living Jazz, or I'm not sure what they changed the name to. Of course, Madeline Eastman and she were like in control of it for the longest time and now um um stacy is madeline stepped down from it and uh the drummer a female drummer um you know very well known anyway she's she stepped into madeline's spot so stacy is going to be on on monday and uh really um this hungarian guitarist who lives in in uh, Chicago, you might have known him, Zvon Tot. No, I didn't know, know him. him. Well, mm-hmm. when I was in uh, Yugoslavia on tour um, for, I don't know, I think it was like two months. Anyway, the, the war was started, of course, when I went. <laughs> oh. And anyway, to, to get out of Yugoslavia was a really uh, challenging and scary kind of a thing and Zvon I met Zvon at a jazz club and he he I mean I say he saved my life because that's how I really felt I felt like he saved my life but anyway then he moved to America and he, he went to Chicago he's a really good player and so he's going to be on and um maybe you know that the drummer of uh Ferenc Nemeth yes he's going to be do. on Wednesday oh cool <laughs> wow he's awesome He's a very yes, talented played, person, isn't he? He, he played with Lionel Luque and oh. Massimo Biocati, that, that trio. So he's great. Yeah, very talented. Yep, so <clears throat> it's going to be really fun. Later later uh, this month, later in fe- or maybe in February, uh, Flora Purim is going to be on. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, I'm looking forward wow. to that. That's great. Yeah. That's so great. So anyway, Thank thanks so for much. being here, sweetie. Yeah. And uh, hugs. virtual hugs. Hugs too. Oh, and um, can we see your dog one more time? Yes. What's his the dog's name, name again? His name is Louie, and he's a doll. He's like an, a grumpy old man, but very sweet, very smart. He seems to have a really interesting perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. There's something about his perspective, you know. He, he's just like, it's very copacetic, you know. <laughs> Bye, Louie. Bye. <laughs>
Okay, have fun. Bye. Bye, sweetie pie. Love you. Bye, love you.